My name is Olympia Vernon. I am the author of three novels, Eden, Logic, and A Killing in This Town, and I am a writer. Mm -hmm. um, I love like engaging um, in conversation with the students. Um, yesterday at the Craft Talk, um, I was able to talk to a couple of the students and you know, answer their questions and give them some idea of what it's like to be a writer and to basically inspire them and let them know that as long as they have a passion for writing, that makes them a writer. They don't have to be published to be a writer. They only have to have a passion for it. Would you tell the people that are looking to write and like, what should they be focusing on? Yes. People who would like to write, I would just say to them to write, um, to not worry about whether um, to not worry about outlines or to use index cards, which I call them index card writers. Um, just really trust your characters, trust what they have to say. Um, don't try to control them or tame them. Just let them be themselves and let the story take place naturally as it would based on what the characters are feeling. And try not to intervene as a writer. Just let them have their say. Mm -hmm. and, um, and sometimes you're going to have characters who don't agree with you. Um, you're going to have characters um, whom you would like to see live longer um, than the novel um, needs or, you know, requires or whatever, but that's, that's the way life is. This is the scene where Adam is talking to um, his father and his mother, and then he figures it's his mother, and who figures it's his father. And the dog, the dog's name is Midnight. We are white men, born into this earth and land which is ours and belongs to us, as free and automatic white men. All niggers must be obedient. They are not a part of the human thread, but are animals and must be dragged from their properties and stricken from the blood of the nation. The same thing goes for hypocrites. Cooper's hair is wet. The heat had drowned it. There above the words of the candy declaration with the loose board on the third tier of the board, it had fallen out of position. He measured it with his eye and stepped down from the ladder. He walked toward the door that caged tools and felt the roaring patch of hurt in his rib. He lifted his shirt and found his breathing. The left lung had begun to throb. Both he and Earl Thomas at this moment were in vivid synchronicity, but Hoover Pickens was unaware of this. A disjointed moan erupted from his parted lips. He was obtuse. The, he the heaving moan pushed his belly out a bit as if, in some sort of sickening stimulation, he had become incredible. Hoover? Yeah, Dee Time for supper. She was on the steps of the house and an invisible clone of heat rose around her. Hoover! But there was no sign of him. Midnight lay behind her, awaiting Adam. The energy of his silence and what he had seen in the woods, the solid stone of rescue, created a murmur within his heart. He was no longer familiar with the scent of Dee Pickens. She had not comforted him since taking him in her arms to save Adam. She was ungrateful. Dead. Dee Dee Pickens, for the first time, felt the bitter gaze of this animal, a rotten and ill fated disregard for the oxygen that allowed him in unison to breathe its air and temperature as hot and merciful as it was. She went to touch him, her quiet hand above him, and he snored at her. As if to say in the language of creature and earth, it's come too late in the world. Adam stood at the bottom of the stairs. He had seen the happening and walked to where the screen door where Dee Dee Pickens stood in full dress. He thought it in his mind, but it had not come out of him. The question, what have you done? Dee Dee Pickens brought her hand to her hip and in some awareness of detail moved away from midnight. The hair of the night's fine was in disarray. Straight up it stood until Dee Dee Pickens was forever gone this evening. She closed the door of her bedroom, and when midnight heard it, he returned to his original position, his warm belly on the bed of the breakfast porch. Adam had disappeared into the mouth of the barn. Adam had only vaguely heard of what the other barn had done to Curtis Willow. He was in the high window of the house when Salem heard Willow describe his swollen torso and the bloated head. It was no wonder that when Adam's father sent him to her little slab the morning after the dragon, he vomited at the sight of the corpse. Curtis's body lay on the wooden gurney, the head had a hole in it, and hurry had sent stuck a pipe in it that had begun to whistle. It went straight to the back of the head with a hole in his eye, a whistling, pitiful sound that Adam could not hold in his stomach. At once, the food he had eaten before coming was strewn from his esophagus and onto the cold, cold floor. 
He recalled that evening his father had sent him out for packaging things. It was customary for the clan of Willow, Mississippi to save the contents of a nigger's pocket. His father wanted him to see it, the nigger blood and bone, the duty that awaited him, the power, the masterful work of the free and automatic white man. Adam had gone from her little slab, the contents trembling in his little hand, only to find his father standing on the breakfast porch, an overt grin leaning into his face. Adam got the package in front of him and ran up the stairs of the house up to his room where the stench of his stomach had begun to levitate above the space he had collapsed into. Now Adam stood in the barn's opening. It was Sunday. The guard Miller had fitted him early this morning. Free from memory and the normal needle, she had returned to the unremorseful place in her heart. And it was indeed the Nora Bullock who could not confine the whisper. She had been waiting on her letter from the vital life office when she said, You've got a killing, 